Hey class, today we're going to be looking at a heat equation. Suppose that we have a one-dimensional rod that's bounded on either side. The length of it goes from 0 to pi. We want to look at how the, temperature chair, how the temperature varies with respect to time. So, this is a parabolic second-order partial differential equation, and it takes this form. ut equals phi squared uxx. We're going to take first a look at this notation. Ut is the first derivative of u with respect to time. Uxx is equal to the second derivative of u with respect to x. In order to solve these types of equations, we need to have three boundaries. The first two are boundary conditions, and they act at the very ends of the function u. So we're going to have Newman conditions. Newman conditions bound the flux. So this is the first derivative of u. And these take place at either end. So u0, u pi, and they're continuous throughout time. And we're going to say that these are both equal to zero. So the change in temperature at the ends of our rod is zero. The next condition that we have is the initial distribution of temperature. So this is going to say u of x, so throughout the whole rod, uh, zero, so time zero equals f of x. For example, if f of x was equal to one, you'd have a temperature distribution that looks like this, just one constant across the rod. If it was equal to x, then it would go from zero to pi. Next, we're going to look at how we solve these types of equations with these boundaries. To solve the heat equation, we are going to make the assumption that the solution to the partial differential equation takes the form u of x t is equal to x of x times t of t. This allows us to represent the individual terms in the PDE as u t equals t prime times x and u x x equals x double prime times t. We can then substitute these back into the original partial differential equation as follows. t prime times x equals v squared x double prime t. And after massaging it with some algebra, we can separate the like terms onto either side. t prime over t times v equals x double prime over x. There is only one class of conditions that allows this to be true, and that is both of these are equal to a single constant, a separation constant, which we are going to call minus lambda. This allows us to separate the partial differential equation into two separate ordinary differential equations as follows, which is x, x double prime plus lambda x equals zero, and t prime plus v squared lambda t equals zero. Note that these are still the, the large capital X and T that we saw over here, and these cannot be just directly substituted back in as X and T. Alright, now that we know what we have to do with lambda, we have to solve the boundary value problem for the three possible eigenvalues. The first of which being if lambda is equal to zero, the second being if lambda is less than zero, and the third of which being if lambda is greater than zero. Moving on to the first eigenvalue, if possibility, if lambda equals zero, we would get the solution for x, x equals ax plus b. Applying our initial conditions here, x prime of zero equals x prime of pi, which would equal zero, we get that x prime equals a, which is a non-trivial solution, and we prove that lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue. Moving on to the next possible eigenvalue, we make the substitution that lambda is equal to negative p squared. Moving into our characteristic equation, we get r squared minus p squared equals zero, and r equals plus or minus p. From that, we solve for x and get that x is equivalent to c1e to the px 
plus c2 e to the minus px. Taking the first derivative so we can apply our boundary conditions, we get x prime equals p c1 e to the px minus p c2 e to the minus px. Applying these conditions, we get x prime of 0 equals p c1 minus p c2, and therefore we prove that c1 is equivalent to c2, which equals 0, which shows that this is a trivial solution and that lambda is less than 0 is not an eigenvalue. Moving on to the third equation, we evaluate whether or not lambda is greater than zero. Making the substitution that lambda is equal to p squared, we get the characteristic equation r squared plus p squared equals zero. Solving for r, we get r equals plus or minus ip, where i is not the imaginary number. Solving for x, we get x equals c1 cos px plus c2 sine px. Taking the first derivative, we get x prime equals minus p c1 sine px plus c2 p cos px. Applying our first boundary condition, we get x prime of zero equals c2 p, which equals zero, therefore proving that c2 is equal to zero. Applying x prime of pi, we get minus p c1 sine p pi equals zero. Therefore, we know that c1 must not equal zero, so sine p pi must equal zero. Therefore, p equals n, where n is any integer. Therefore, we get that xn equals n squared, and substituting, we get xn equals cn cosine n x. After solving for lambda, we find that there are two eigenvalues it may take. A lambda equals zero, which when plugged into t prime over t, tells us that t naught is a constant, and lambda equals minus n squared, which when plugged into t prime over t, tells us that uh, the natural log of t is equal to minus p squared n squared t. This is after integrating, so when we rearrange it to get t on its own, we get uh, another constant in there. And then substituting that back into our original equation for u, we find that un is equal to a n k n times e to the minus p squared n squared t times cosine of nx. We can do the same thing with our uh, with our t naught and x naught, and then plug these in here to uh, this formula, and then we find that u is ultimately equal to a naught plus the summation from n equals one to infinity times a n e to the minus p squared n squared t times cosine of nx. So all that remains is to solve for a naught and a n. All right. So to wrap up this, u equals a0 plus n from 1 to infinity a n e to the minus n squared phi squared t cosine n x. You may note that this looks like a cos uh, Fourier cosine series. So because of that we can apply the initial conditions and solve for the constants that we have using the properties of a cosine series. These equations are developed separately but they allow us to solve for u of x and t very nicely.